Hello and welcome back. So what I want to talk to you about today is variable inductors. And in particular, I want to talk about the variometer. Now, I'm not referring to the aircraft instrument, but rather the variable inductor. So I want to look at how the thing works, what are its limitations, and then finally try to actually build one and see how it works. So if you're curious, then keep watching. So normally when you use an inductor in a circuit, for example a power supply or a noise filter, the exact value doesn't matter that much. So most power inductors are like 20% tolerant and their value also changes with the applied current, but that's not really a big problem. On the other hand, in circuits like radio frequency filters or oscillators or things like that, the exact value is very important. So you do have available inductors that have very precise values, but which are also not very cheap. Now, you also have the case in which you don't just want an inductor with a precise value, but you also want to be able to change the value during the operation or initial calibration of the device. And to see just how that can be achieved, let's look at the main ways of how you can change the value of any given inductor. Now, you have two sets of parameters determining what its inductance value is. On the one side, you will have mechanical parameters. So how many turns the inductor has, what is the area of the inductor, what's its length, and you also have magnetic properties. So the permeability of the environment inside and around the coil. So you can have either air core like this inductor, or you can insert all sorts of materials inside it to increase permeability. So one common way of making variable inductors is to have a fixed inductor with fixed number of turns and diameter and mechanical properties, but to have a variable ferrite slug that you can wind in and out of the inductor to change its inductance by fine values. And for small signal applications, this is a very nice method. Now, if you have higher power circuitry, one of the properties of magnetic materials that you need to take into consideration is that they saturate. And depending on what sort of magnetic field is going through the material, its permeability will decrease. So the inductance of the inductor won't really be a constant. It will slightly depend on the current going through the inductor. So for high power applications, this sort of ferrite slug is not really the right way to go. Now, another approach that is commonly used is to deform the inductors. So especially with low value inductors, one with thick wiring in radio frequency circuitry, you have the option of simply deforming the inductor, increasing its length or splitting it up into multiple inductors, and this will decrease the initial inductance. But although this is a very nice method, it's very simple, very low cost, and since it doesn't have an air core, this inductor will not saturate, so it will keep its inductance regardless of the current going through it. But this is a one-time thing, so you're not going to be able to change the inductance value of this sort of inductor every day, because at some point it will just break. And this is how we get to the variometer, because the variometer is a type of inductor where you can change its value based on its mechanical properties, and it has an air core. And to understand how that works, we need to remember what inductance you get when you connect two inductors in series. Now, this is not such a simple problem, because one of the things that the total inductance value will rely upon is how the two inductors are coupled. So if there's no magnetic coupling in between the two inductors, their magnetic fields are completely isolated, this can be achieved with either large distance in between the inductors, or magnetic shielding, or simply putting the inductors at 90 degree angles one from the other, so the magnetic fields only intersect but they never overlap, then the total inductance value will be the sum of the two inductors. So if the two inductors are identical, then it will be double that of one inductor. Now, if the two magnetic fields do interact, if there is a coupling in between the two inductors, say we add the two inductors one next to the other, and they're both wound in the same direction, then 
the total inductance value can be worked out by assuming that we have a single inductor with double the number of turns, and because the inductance can be calculated by the square of the number of turns, then doubling the turns will yield four times the inductance. So depending on the physical construction, of course, you can get up to four times the inductance of the initial inductor if you put the inductors in series and they are perfectly coupled. Now, the other extreme case is when one of the inductors is wound in one direction and the other inductor is flipped around. So this way half the turns are wound into one direction and are creating a magnetic field into one direction and the other half of the turns is wound the other way and are creating an opposing magnetic field. If the inductors are coupled this way, then the total inductance will be zero because the two magnetic fields created by the two inductors cancel each other out. So in an ideal world, if you perfectly couple two inductors that have the same inductance value, then the total inductance will be zero. And this is basically what the variometer is based upon. You'd need two inductors and you need to couple them and simply rotate one in reference to the other. And you will get a minimum inductance when the two inductors are coupled, but they are forming opposing fields. You will get a certain value when the two inductors are at 90 degree angles, and then you will get the maximum inductance when the two inductors are again coupled, but facing the same way. Now, the only issue is that you need to get the inductors to couple well, and that means that you need to get them somehow to fit one inside of the other. So you can't have identical inductors that have the identical size. You can have identical inductance, but not identical physical parameters. Now, it's also important to mention that the variometer has disadvantages. So on the one side, since we're always using the same coils, the same wire, the equivalent series resistance is constant. And the problem with that is that it influences the Q factor of the inductor. So this Q factor will be proportional to the inductance. Maximum inductance, maximum Q factor. Minimal inductance, minimum Q factor. Another thing to mention is the resonance frequency of the inductor. So again, the capacity stays roughly constant, but the inductance varies. So also the resonance frequency will have a variation. So it's important to make sure that whatever frequency you want to use the variometer at, it still works like an inductor. So you don't pass its resonance frequency. Now, to build this thing, I will be relying on a 3D printer because, well, you can build it out of wood or something, but the printer just makes things so much easier. And the actual variometer will have an inner core and an outer core with the mention that there needs to be a certain separation between the two. So the two are concentric, but they are not touching. And to get a better understanding of the distance that we need, we can look at a cross section of the thing. So the small inductor will be rotating on an axis inside the big inductor, but to be able to actually rotate, the two inductors don't need to hit each other. And that can only be achieved if the diagonal of the inner inductor, so the distance between the furthermost point on it and its center is smaller than the inner radius of the large inductor. If this condition is met, then the two inductors can rotate one inside of the other. So other than the two inductors, we'll be needing some sort of axis on which the small inductor is glued and this rotates it inside of the large inductor. And one of the features I've added are these holes so that you can take the wires from the inner inductor through the shaft and take it out so that the two inductors can be interconnected. This whole thing will be sitting on a structure so something that keeps the large coil in place, but also has the shaft fixed. So it works like a bearing in which the shaft can rotate. Now to keep the shaft in place so it doesn't fall off, I also added this cap here that just, well, keeps the shaft in place. And finally, I also added the knob so that, well, it's easier to turn. And some sort of grid will be placed on the stand so that you know where exactly the inner coil is. So in the program at least everything fits together, looks all perfect. Now let's see how this actually looks like in real life. This is gonna take a while. 
So the parts turned out pretty well. We have the main frame on which everything is going to sit. We have the inner coil, the shaft and the knob with which everything can be turned. And then we have the outer coil and this cap thing that will hold the shaft in place. So next thing to do is to add the coils to, well, the coils. One, two, seven. So all of the inductors are done. The glue that's keeping the turns in place has set. And next thing to do is to assemble everything. Now, one of the things to keep in mind with the large inductor, since it's made out of two pieces, is that you want the two little inductors to work as a single inductor. So you to have the turns all going the same way in both. And that means that you need to take care how you interconnect the two inductors. For example, I managed to turn both inductors in opposite ways. So if I would connect the two closest lines, then the two inductors would cancel out. So that's not a good thing. So this is just something to keep in mind. Regarding assembly, well, one of these pieces will go on the bottom side. There's already a ring here to keep it in place. So this will be fixed with some glue. You can adjust it using the shaft. So just to have it in from the right place. The inner inductor goes onto the shaft and the exact position is dictated by this change in diameter. After this glues into place, then you can also insert the wiring through the internal holes so that the wires go out through the shaft. Finally, this goes into place. Second piece of the upper inductor can get glued on top. And also we have this cap here that you can either screw in with some screws or glue it in. And we also have the knob that again needs to be glued on the other edge. So this is quite a fiddly job. So I will fast forward to everything being done, but those are really the steps in which this thing needs to be assembled. Let's see how it actually works out. Now there's one more constructive feature I would like to point out. And this is important to take into account when you're assembling the thing. And that is that the axle, the shaft has this key thing that prevents it from over rotating. So because this thing is present and also there's these grooves in the bearing, that means that the axle can only rotate 180 degrees because that's all that you really need. And now the thing to keep in mind is that since you only have the 180 degrees of rotation, you want to get this rotation between the two extreme angles between the inductors. So when your key is on the side like this, then you want your inductor to be at 90 degrees angles from it. So the inner inductor has to be perfectly vertical when this key is horizontal. This way you can rotate it between the two extreme positions. So this is what the whole thing looks like assembled. We got the inner coil glued onto the shaft and to the knob so it all turns quite nicely. All the inductors are interconnected and then we only have two wires going outside. So all in all turned out quite nicely. Last thing to do is to see that it actually works and see what sort of inductance interval do we actually get out of it. And for that I prepared this little setup. So what I got here is my variometer connected to the inductance meter and at the moment it's measuring 164 microhenries and well if we turn the inner inductor using the knob we can see that the measured inductance starts to decrease. So we are going from the initial 164 microhenry down to about 59. Now it's worth mentioning though that because my multimeter has an offset of about minus 11 microhenry, the actual values are 17 microhenry and 175. 
So there's not that big of a ratio between maximum and minimum inductors, but the thing works. Now, of course, you can improve the performance and there's two main things that will help. First of all, my two inductors don't really have the same inductance. There's about 10 microhenry of inductance difference between the two, probably because I either didn't count the turns right or I didn't calculate how many turns are needed or maybe both. And the second problem we have is the coupling between the two inductors. So because of the large distance in between them, you don't have a perfect coupling. And this can be improved by decreasing the distance. And to do that, you can build the inductors rather than on a cylindrical shape into a spherical shape. So if you have two spheres one inside of the other, you can easily rotate them without hitting each other and also have a very small distance in between. Other things that might be helpful, of course, would be to have some sort of cogwheel system to have a much finer control over the rotation. So rather than to just have 180 degrees on the knob, to have a bit more. But that is a project for a different time. For now, the thing works. You can build it. I will be leaving links to the 3D files in the description, so go check that out. And this thing can be used either for antenna tuning, so if you have a transmitter and you want to fine tune the antenna, or you can also use it with a basic tuned circuit to replace a variable capacitor. So all in all, hope you got some useful information out of this, leave your thoughts in the comments, thank you for watching, make sure to subscribe to be up to date with all my videos, and see you next time. Bye bye.